I want to go ahead and welcome everyone for our second evening together in our revival. And we're going to be doing our health talk. And once we get the screen up, which we now have, I will go ahead and talk with you a little bit about something called the laws of health. How many of us are familiar with the laws of health? Have you ever heard of that before? All right. Well, when we're talking about the laws of health, they are obviously things that governs the body, things that are a must. They are necessary in order to have health and to have life. If we do not have these things, then we will not have life. And I can give you an example of this. When you think about laws of health, there's an acronym that is typically used called New START. And N stands for nutrition, E for exercise, W for water, S for sunshine, T for temperance, A for air, R for rest, and then T for trust in God. Now, New START is one acronym, but how many of you have ever heard of the acronym God's Plan? Let me see your hands. How many of you have heard of the acronym God's Plan? Okay, just a few of us. Now, the acronym God's Plan, one of the things I like about it is it's very much rooted in the Bible, as you can see. Each letter in God's plan stands for a principle that governs our life, a law of health. G stands for godly trust, O for open air, D for daily exercise, S for sunshine, P for proper rest, L for lots of water, uh, A for always temperate, and N for nutrition. And as you can see, they all have their roots right in Scripture. And this is something very important. There's a time that people used to think the laws of health was something that originated with uh, Mrs. Ellen G. White, but that's not true. These things are right in Scripture, these laws of health. And God created them for yours and for my benefit. Now, what are some of the benefits? Because when we uh, go through our health lectures every night, we're going to expound on this more. So when you think about godly trust, that is how we relieve stress. Can stress contribute or even cause a disease? Oh, for sure. And so the more, you, have you ever heard of somebody who's peacefully stressed out? You ever heard of that before? I never heard of that. <laughs> I haven't heard of it. You know, if you're, you're peacefully stressed out, usually they are oxymorons. They don't go together. In other words, the more that we have godly trust is the more you will find it will relieve your stress. And this becomes a protection to us when it comes to our health. Open air, that is what helps purify our blood. Pure air is one of the means by which how we get pure blood. And so we want to make sure that we are surrounding ourselves with pure air. Now, as I was driving earlier today from the airport, I noticed that your mountains were not clear. And I was trying to understand why. Because where I live, I live in Northern California. And where I live, the mountains are crystal, crystal clear. But for some reason here, the mountains are not as clear as this haze. And I was asking my beloved escort there, I said, uh, Brother Edwin, I said, why can't I see the mountains properly? What's going on? What is all this stuff blocking it? And thus far, it seems like it might be some degree of possible pollution or things of that nature that's not allowing it to be so visible. Well, there's a way you can still get pure, fresh air even if it's not necessarily outside. And I can't wait to talk to you about that. Daily exercise, that's how you strengthen your cells. That is how you strengthen your cells. The three things that, the uh, things that comes from our bone marrow, our blood platelets and our white blood cells and things of that nature, the more that you exercise and move, it helps keep not only good bone density, but it also helps good white blood cell production. And therefore, exercise is a very important thing that helps keep those cells nice and strong. Sunshine is how we activate our genes. There are over 400 genes in the body that get activated when we sit in sunlight. And so we're going to talk about the importance of getting out there in the sun. You know, one thing we have a lot of here in California is sunlight, maybe too much because we could use a little bit of rain. But nevertheless, we also know that sunlight has tremendous benefits. It helps activate a lot of those genes that helps keep yours and my body very healthy. Proper rest is when you do body repair. This is when the body is repairing. As you're resting, your body is recuperating from all of that exertion 
that it was giving all throughout the day, and therefore we need to get not just rest, but we need to get proper rest. I'll be talking about that. Lots of water is how we keep ourselves functioning. Our body is an ocean. The body is over 70% water. The brain is over 75% water. We are a walking ocean, and therefore we need to keep our bodies hydrated so that it functions as properly as it does. Isn't it interesting that one of the first things that happens when we get admitted into a hospital is they hook us up to an IV? You know, and one of the reasons for that is to get the body nice and hydrated so that whatever medications or whatever you're getting, everything can work quickly and effectively. So even, you know, our traditional medical practitioners understand that, hey, we need to keep that body hydrated. Always temperate, or in other words, always practicing self-control. That's how we protect ourselves from harm. You ever heard of something called overdoing it? There are a lot of us that are unfortunately victims to this. Some of us overwork. Some, believe it or not, you can overexercise. A lot of people don't know about that. That night, when we, on the night that we talk about exercise, we're going to talk about what is too little, but we're also going to talk about what's too much. Sometimes if you do too much exercise, you can still invite the very diseases you're trying to avoid. And so we're going to talk about that. So definitely always temperate, practicing self-control. It protects you from unnecessary harm. Lastly, nutrition, well, that's our medicine. That's our medicine. Food is our medicine. And so the more we understand how to eat properly and to drink properly, you're going to find that it can help mitigate many of the problems that many of us face in the realm of sickness and disease. So night after night, we're going to be talking at it. As of tomorrow night, we're going to dive into God's plan, and we're going to learn a lot. And my hope and prayer is that we'll apply a lot and get all the blessings that heaven has in store for us. What do you say? Do you say amen to that? Amen. Good. Well, God bless you. This is the laws of health. God bless you. All of your prayers. I am very grateful to be here with you all this evening. And I have to tell you that I'm... I'm I'm thankful for the opportunity to give this message tonight. This message is very serious, and this message is very solemn. And as I prepare to go into this message, I want you to understand something. 31 years ago, I was in the hip hop and R&B industry. I was a dancer and a choreographer for a lot of celebrities. I was doing television movies or really television and video, music videos, and I was destined to become, you know, a very famous dancer, choreographer, and also an actor. And it was this movement, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, it was this movement that came across my path at a time when I was really looking for God and trying to understand the Lord. And I have to tell you that as a result of studies and going through so much, I truly can tell you that I love this church. I am very, very privileged to be a part of what I call this movement. And I'm very thankful for the things that I have learned. It's helped to shape me into the man, yea, the man of God that God has called me to be. And so when I say to you that I have a true love for this movement, I have a devotion to this movement, and I have a commitment to this church, I want you to understand that this is my position, even as I prepare to go through our study tonight dealing with prophecy being fulfilled in the church. This is something that is very serious and dear to my heart. And if there's one person who knows where my heart is coming from, it's my beloved bride, Alexandra. And I'm just very grateful to share with you the things that the Lord has laid, not just on my heart, but many people's hearts. But you're gonna need to pray. You're gonna need to pray that God will give you ears to hear, to make sure you don't hear what you think, 
but you hear what you heard. And it's going to be important that as my dear brother shared with you all those three things, you got to bring your Bible with you. You want to bring pen and paper or some ability to take notes. But most importantly, as you said, man, you were right on that. Most importantly, a prayerful heart. I don't want you to worry about who's listening. You make sure you're listening and you hear what the Spirit wants to say to the church. And so as we prepare our hearts to go through our study tonight, prophecy fulfilled in the church, I'm going to ask that we would please have a word of prayer. Now, I'm going to kneel to do that. If you would like to, you can kneel with me. If you do not want to kneel, that's all right. Just bow your heads where you are. But let's pray and let's be reverent in our prayers as we approach the Lord. So let's pray together at this time. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for blessing us all to be reunited this evening. We are very grateful for the opportunities to once again hear heaven speak while we on earth remain silent before thee. And Lord, as we once again see prophecy fulfilled, we pray that you will please encourage our hearts to experience the end result, that when it comes to pass, we might believe. And I pray help our unbelief. For we ask all of these things in the worthy and the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. I want you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter. We're going to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Jesus asked a very compelling question to his disciples. He said to them, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And when he asked that question, there was a few answers that he got. Of course, Peter was one who loved to talk. Peter was one of the first to go up and say, Oh, well, some say thou art this or thou art that, and so on. But then he ended up asking, Well, who do you say that I am? Because that's really what counts. Family, we need to understand that there's no one that's going to enter into heaven because of how religious your relatives were, your parents were, or anybody else. If you and I make it into the kingdom, it's going to be as a result of the union, the connection, the communion, the relationship, the commitment we have with God. And so that was a very good question when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Because it doesn't really matter what everybody else is saying. And again, Peter comes up and he says, well, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus loved that answer. But Jesus also made a very solemn statement. And this is the first time the word church appears in the Bible. First time is right here in Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now, if you're there, please let me know by saying amen. In Matthew 16, it was right there in verse 18. Well, let's look at 17, and then we'll take it to 18. In verse 17, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now watch verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my what? I will build my church. And then Jesus makes a solemn statement. He says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, if I tell you something, you have a right to be suspicious. If you tell me something, I have a right to be suspicious to some degree. And the reason why is because we have a tendency to not always follow through on our words. Sometimes we say we're going to do things, we don't do it. You ever told somebody you're going to call them back and you never call back? You ever told somebody, I'll pray for you, and you never prayed for them? You ever told someone that you were going to... Now, keep in mind, when you told them you were going to call back, did you notice that everything in you meant to call them back? Did you notice that when you told somebody, I'll pray for you, everything in you really meant it? You were sincere when you said, I'll pray for you. But for some reason, we got distracted. Well, over time, after we repeat this process... We begin to see that our words are not very trustworthy, even when we have sincere intent. 
I found out one of the easiest ways to not be bitter with people is to not expect too much from people. The higher I place my expectations on you when you disappoint me, the harder it hits me emotionally. But if I just say, you know, so-and-so said they're going to do this or do that, but at the same time, I know that they're flesh, I know that they have weaknesses, there's a chance they might fulfill it, but there's a chance they may not. So, okay, no problem, but I'm already prepared for the contingency plan. But not so with Jesus. There is not a word, there's not a promise that Jesus has made that he has failed on his promise. Not one. Everything that Christ said he will do, he has done or he will do. And so when Jesus says, you are Peter and upon this rock I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus said that, you can take that to the bank. You can put your full trust in it. Now here's the thing. When Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail, do you know what the indication was in the verse? The gates of hell will be the gates of hell will attack the church. The first time the word church comes up in the Bible, already Jesus is making it known. The church is going to undergo attack. The church is going to be attacked. And there's a reason for this. You see, the word church in the Greek is this Greek word right here called ecclesia. This word ecclesia means a calling out, a religious congregation, an assembly. In other words, the word church means a or the called out ones. Whenever you think of the church, biblically speaking, the word church is indicative of the called out ones. They were called out. Now, what do you think is the obvious question? Called out of what? Go to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. I want you to watch what the Bible says. We're now going to go to the book of 1 Peter, and we're going to consider chapter 2. And I want you to see what the Bible says as we consider the question, called out of what? And we're going to give a Bible answer. In 1 Peter chapter 2, I want you to see what the Bible says as we consider the question, called out of what? The word church means a calling out. It's a, an assembly of people who were called out. It's a religious congregation of people who were called out. But the question is, called out from what? So now we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to consider verse 9. Now if you're there, just let me know by saying, Amen. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, the Bible says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, now watch this, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of what? Darkness. And then called us into his marvelous light. The church in God's mind is an assembly or a group of people that he has called out of darkness and called them into his marvelous light. Now, the Bible, when it talks about darkness, is not talking about literal darkness. It's talking about darkness in a spiritual context. And so it's talking about light in a spiritual context. So when we think of light, there are three lights in Scripture that the Bible highlights in a spiritual sense. What constitutes light in a spiritual context? Because that's what Peter's talking about. Peter is not talking about people who was in a dark room and then came into a room filled with a whole bunch of lights on. That doesn't make you and I holy. That doesn't make us peculiar. And that doesn't make us chosen. 
The chosen generation, the holy nation, the peculiar people are as a result of coming out of spiritual darkness and entering into spiritual light. I want you to think and to assess your heart tonight because there's a lot of people that are showing up to a building, but they are not yet members of God's church. Because what is a church? It's a group of called out ones. Called out from what? Darkness into what? God's marvelous light. What are the three lights that the Bible talks about in Scripture? Number one, Psalm 119, 105. The Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a what else? Light unto my path. You see, when you and I live lifestyles that are governed by the word of God, you are entering into God's marvelous light. And you know what darkness is? Darkness is a lifestyle when this book looks like this. Closed. Isn't it crazy how there's a lot of people who go to church, but they never open up the Word? They never study the Word. And I wonder, is it possible to come to church and still be in darkness? Because what is darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. So what are we learning? Light is here. Light is God's Word. So what is darkness? None of God's Word. What do you live by? Do you live by what you think is right? Do you live by what you feel is right? Or do you live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? God says, my church are a group of called out ones. They are called out of a lifestyle of no word, and they're called into a lifestyle where every step they take is governed by the word. Oh, but it's not just that. You see, light is not just the word. But did you know in the word, it points us to another light. Want to know what that light is? It's right here, Proverbs 6 and verse 23. The Bible says in Proverbs 6 and verse 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. If we truly have been called out of darkness, we've also been called out of lawlessness. There are a lot of people today that live a lawless lifestyle. Young people, you got to be careful who you hang out with. It's all right to have friends that are lawless as long as you're trying to show some light to them. But if you're hanging around a bunch of lawless friends, then if you don't take a stand, that was our song tonight. If you and I don't take a stand, isn't it interesting how they can pull us away from light and they can help lead us into darkness? I'd like to encourage our young people to start becoming more strong. I believe with all of my heart that the young generation today is one of the weakest generations this earth has ever seen. All you got to do is not hit like on a Facebook post or an Instagram post. And you got young people getting all depressed and, 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 and thinking some of the worst thoughts. Do you understand when I went to school, people walked right up to my face and called me ugly? When I used to go to school, people would literally walk to my face and say, you are ugly. There are people who would walk up to me and they would push me and want to go ahead and start a fight. One of them even hit me one time. You think I went into, I didn't go into depression. When somebody called me ugly, I was like, you'll see. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like when somebody would go ahead and try to, to punch me in my face, I was like, all right, you hit me this time, but you're not going to hit me again. And then boom, I would come back at him. When I was young, we were stronger. The young generation today, it, it, I, I marvel at how incredibly weak we have become. We get derailed and we think life is horrible because you didn't get enough likes on a social media post. This is one of the reasons why you got to be guarded of your surroundings because if you're that weak, then you need to do everything possible to surround yourself with that which is strong. 
That's why I encourage the young people like never before. Get serious about God. That's, that's how you'll start discovering strength. That's how you're going to develop some tough skin that when people throw stuff at you, you'll be able to say, okay, I mean, I heard what you said, but as the good old saying says, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Daniel was a young man and brought into captivity. Daniel's name is Daniel, which means God is my judge. Yahweh is my judge. That pagan king comes along and he says, well, I'm going to call you a pagan God's name. You didn't see Daniel going into a whole bunch of depression? You didn't see Daniel losing himself? You know what? Every time in the Bible, in the book of Daniel, every time Daniel got a chance to say his name, he never once said the pagan name that was given to him. He would say, I, Daniel. He would say, me, Daniel. He would always call himself his name. You know why? Because the brother knew his name. Do you know your name? Don't let people twist and turn you around so easily, family. We got to develop some tough skin. But part of it's going to be our surroundings. And if you're hanging around a bunch of lawless folks, then maybe by beholding, we become changed. And lo and behold, we become lawless. God says, you are mine. God says, you are my church. And, my <clears throat> and God says, and my church are a people that have been called out of darkness and called into my light. And what is God's light? His word. What is God's light? His law. What else is God's light? Notice. Forgive me. God's word, God's law, Jesus himself. The Bible says in John 9 and verse 5, as long as I am in the world, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Quite honestly, if you want to know what does a life look like when it's governed by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God and submits itself unto God's holy law and his commandments, you know what that life looks like? We call it a Christ-like life. That was Jesus. Jesus was a man who walked on this earth and he lived by the word and he honored the Father and his law. And Jesus therefore said, I am the light of the world. These are the three lights in scripture. So when we're called out of darkness, we're called out of a lifestyle of no word and just feelings. You know, the biggest reason why we're in the confusion we're in right now is because the world, and sadly, many churches are agreeing with it, the world said, if you feel it, it is truth. Do you realize that that's the world we live in today? If you feel it, it is truth. I'm, I don't know if you're starting to hear this nowadays. Are you starting to hear more people say, my truth? What truth do you, how, what in the world, how did you create truth in your short little 15 years? What truth did you create? But this is the world we live in. So nowadays, everybody has their own little personal truths that they made. Jesus says, I am the truth. He says, my word is truth. My law is truth. But today, everybody's coming up with their own gimmicks and their own ideas. The reason why the world is in as much confusion as it's in, family, is because people are now living by their feelings and not living by the word. You know what the Bible says? Jeremiah 17, 9, the Bible says, The mind is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can trust it? That's what the Word says. The Word says our minds are deceitful. Proverbs 14 and verse 12, it says, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Word says. We have to get out of this thinking that because I feel it, it is truth. You and I are living under the power of deception if we do that. The church, the people of God, they don't live by what they feel. In fact, Jesus made it very clear. He said, if any man comes after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Do you understand how unwelcome that is today? The whole world is saying, assert yourself. 
Jesus comes along, he says, deny yourself. And so the reality is, is that there is a war. And that's why I showed you in our last meeting on Sunday night, I showed you how the world is in big trouble because they're following what they feel rather than what is truth. And the devil set up multiple traps. But now we're talking about the church. You see, the effect of light is very powerful in the Bible. The effect of light has many things. Number one, it keeps you on safe paths, knowing danger is ahead, okay? Light keeps you on safe paths, knowing that danger is ahead. An example is, but the path of the just, the Bible says in Proverbs 4, but the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. That's what the effect of light is. It shines bright before us. It lets those who experience true justification by faith know where to take the next step. In fact, Peter says it like this. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star arises in your heart. One of the effects of light is it keeps you and I on safe paths and helps us know the danger that is ahead. Do you remember one of the texts we looked at on Sunday night? Proverbs 22, 3. The wise man, the prudent man or woman, foresees the evil that comes and they hide themselves. Do you see how Peter's saying the same point? Peter's saying, listen, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed unto it as unto a light. Prophecy is like a light. And what does it do? It helps guide us. It helps guide us if there's a dark place. It shows us, don't go there, it's dark. And it shows us exactly what path to go on. This is the effect of light. Another effect of light, another beautiful effect of light, in fact, is it separates itself from darkness. Light separates itself from darkness. Notice what the Bible says. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. This is why sometimes when we see Christians doing certain things or when we see professed Christians at certain places, sometimes we have a right to say, why are you here? If you're walking in the light, why are you here? What are you doing here? I remember the artist formerly known as Prince. A lot of people don't know, but he grew up Seventh-day Adventist. And Prince himself was doing a performance on a Friday night. And when Prince was doing his performance on Friday night, I have no idea how he found this out, but he said, I heard that there are some Seventh-day Adventists here tonight. And he said, y'all know y'all are not supposed to be here. Can you imagine that? You got a brother rooted in the world that's telling you what you're doing right now is wrong. You are a child of light. What I'm doing tonight is darkness. You don't belong here. I think it was the mercy of God that spoke through that man's mouth and said that. I wish he would have followed his own counsel. I have no idea how his life closed, but we know his life closed. There's only one thing he awaits now, and that's judgment. But the reality is, he said, y'all know y'all don't belong here. You see, when you're the child of light, sometimes you have to ask yourself, what am I doing watching this? What am I doing listening to this? What am I doing at this place right now? I'm a child of light. The more that we understand who we are, the effect of light is it reminds us we don't belong in this dark place right now. We should be only in the places where there is illumination. Another effect of light is it reveals righteousness, which is God's law and his character. The Bible says, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works, which he does. The more that we embrace light, the more that we understand light, beloved, the effect of it is it helps us reveal God's law. It helps us reveal his 
character. And this is what people need to see. You see, a lot of people don't believe in Jesus because they're just not convinced. I have a friend of mine, and this is a true story. It's a very sad story. A friend of mine in the world, and I'm in the church. And he called me up one night, and he said, man, he said, I met this girl. I said, really? He said, yeah, I met this girl, and, and boy, she's beautiful, and all this other stuff. I said, okay. And then he said, yeah, and, and you know, we've been having lots and lots of sexual relations. I said, really? I said, do you even, they said, how long have you known her? He said, I only knew her for like a week. And I was like, man, that's a pretty uh, loose sister. And he said, yeah, and he said, you know what? She's a teacher at one of your Adventist schools. I said, is that right? I said, well, what's her name? Let me find out who she is. Found out who she was, and it was, he was telling the truth. What witness did that leave? You see, my friend Dino, that's my brother, all right? We go way back from high school. We did all sorts of sin together, but I've walked out of that lifestyle of darkness. Now, he's on, his, he's on the road of coming out of that dark lifestyle, too. He's just moving a little slower than I did. But that's my boy, that's my brother, that's my very, very dear friend. And he wanted me to bless his house. He bought a brand new home, wanted me to come down and bless it. And I said, all right, I'll come on down. So I went down there, another friend of mine, beloved friend of mine, Damien, we went down there to bless his home. And I remember that he came to me, and he, we're in his kitchen, he had a beautiful home. We're in his kitchen, and we're hanging out, and he was like, hey, D, you want something to drink? I was like, yeah, man, I'm thirsty. He said, all right. And then he comes along and he gives me a glass with something very red in it. And I was like, Dino, I said, what is this? And he was like, man, it's just a little wine. Didn't Jesus drink wine? And I was like, no, I said, he drank grape juice. Or he, I said, he didn't drink it, first of all. And I said, but secondly, he, it, he turned it into grape juice. It wasn't alcohol. Get this thing away from me. And he, you know what he did? He said, come on, D, don't you remember? And immediately, he's trying to go back into my BC lifestyle. And he's like, come on, D, don't you remember? You don't want some? And he was like throwing it in my face, like, you don't want some? And I looked at him, and I was like, no. And then he's like, come on, man, just a little bit. And I was like, no. And then he was like, D, you don't want just a little bit? And I was like, no. Where's the juice? And he was like, all right. But you know what? Later on that night, when it was time to pray for him and his family, if you could see how much he was listening to me, and he came to me at the end of it, I said, will you consider surrendering your heart afresh to Jesus? Give him a try. He won't fail you. And he said, I will. And he told me, you are one of the only people that I could really take seriously about this God thing. Because he said, you're consistent. You see, what was I doing? I, I took part of the light, and now I was trying to reveal righteousness to him. Righteousness, God's character, says even when it's tempting, we can still say no. Brothers and sisters, you are called to be out of darkness. You are called into the light. And God is using you and wants to use you that much the more that you might reveal his character to a whole lot of people that are longing to see his character. The other effect of light, it illuminates everywhere it goes. Everywhere light goes, it's illuminating. It's illuminating, it's brightening the area. That's why the Bible says it's so clear. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. The light of the world. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says, you and I, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 14 and 15. And so in summary on our first part of our study, in summary on our first part of our study, the church consists of people 
whom God has called out of darkness into the light of his word, law, and the life of Jesus Christ to be lived out within them. This light enables them to keep our feet on safe paths, separate ourselves from spiritual darkness, reveal true righteousness, and touch other lives with it. If you're understanding what I'm saying thus far, let me hear you say amen. All right. Now, there's a church in heaven. The Bible talks about it. But there are three ways that the church on earth is manifested. Remember, our whole study is dealing with the church. I'm taking my time and I'm building the foundation so that when I get to the latter part of our study, you're going to understand why I'm saying the things I'm saying. When we talk about the church on earth, the church on earth was manifested basically in three ways that we know of Scripture. In Matthew 16 and verse 18, as we already read, the Bible says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This was the prophecy of the establishment, forgive me for the B, but it was the establishment of the Christian church. Okay? That was Jesus prophesying of the setup of the Christian church. In the book of Acts, it says they were called Christians first in Antioch, okay? The Christian church. But I don't know if you knew this. Did you know that in Acts 7 and verse 38, the Bible says this is he that was in the church in where? The wilderness. It says, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. That church was referred to as the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation was a church in the eyes of God. They were the ones that were carved out, denominated. They were called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. But then this one also is very important. Romans 16 and verse 5. The Bible says, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. That the church in this context was simply a group of individuals, it was just individuals. I show this to you because the church can take on different phases when you study it in Scripture. The church can take on different phases, but it always has the same goal. Cut out of darkness, brought into God's marvelous light so that they might be light bearers. Now, when we talk about what constitutes the church, we're told in the book Acts of the Apostles, from the beginning, faithful souls have constituted the church on earth. In every age, the Lord has had his watchmen who have borne a faithful testimony to the generation in which they lived. God is always going to have, no matter how corrupt the church gets, no matter how messed up a church gets, God is always going to have some faithful people that love God more than they love themselves. And they're going to do what God says no matter what. And I'm telling you, like right now, you all are eating appetizers, and I hope you're enjoying it, because the entree of the message is getting ready to come. I'm building the case so that when I get to the meat, brothers and sisters, you'll understand where I'm coming from. God had a plan when he raised up the church. It was a beautiful plan. And from the beginning of time, the plan was always the same that they would be a people that is not engrossed in darkness, but they were separated by God into his light, his commandments, his word, his son. And these individuals, as a result of receiving the light, were called to be the light bearers to the whole world. Do you remember what God said to Adam and Eve in the beginning, in Genesis 1? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Did you know that that was God's plan? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Fill the earth with what? Light. Do you remember when Adam and Eve were, I, I don't know if y'all pay attention to scripture sometimes when you read. Sometimes we can read fast and I get it. I used to do that too. I'm still learning to slow down when I read. 
But did you ever pay attention to Genesis 2.25 when the Bible says Adam and Eve were both naked, but they were not ashamed? You ever paid attention to that? Did you know that nakedness and shame always go together in the Bible? If you study it in the book of Isaiah, if you study it in the book of Revelation, if you study it in the book of Proverbs, nakedness and shame always go together. That's why when Laodicea, that messed up church in the last days, you remember what God said? I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And then he said, and I also counsel you to buy of me white raiment that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness does not appear. Revelation 3.18. Shame and nakedness go together. But here goes Adam and Eve. They're naked, but they're not ashamed. Why? Because of the same reason you're not ashamed. Every single one of us in this room right now, we're all naked. We're all naked. But you know why we're not ashamed? Because we have a, cover, a covering over our nakedness called clothes. Adam and Eve were naked and not ashamed because they had a covering. But isn't it deep by the time you get to Genesis 3, the Bible says that when they partook of the fruit, it says their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked. There was something Adam and Eve had in Genesis 2.25 that they lost by Genesis 3.7. The question is, what did they lose? The answer is very simple. Adam and Eve were made in God's image. Is that right? Were they made in God's image? Oh, yes. Go to Psalm 104. I'm going to show you right now what they lost. Look at what they lost. Psalm 104. Very, very easy to see this. In Psalm, the 104th division, it was right here that we see what they had. And it was God's original plan. Watch this. Psalm, the 104th division. And we're now going to consider verses 1 and 2. In Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2, watch what the Bible says. Adam and Eve were made in God's image and his likeness. Now watch Psalm 104, 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed, talking about God, thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Watch verse 2. Who coverest thyself with what? With light as with a garment and who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. So what does God cover himself with like clothing? Light. Adam and Eve were made in God's image. So when God made Adam and Eve, what did he clothe them with? Light. And then when they sinned, they lost the light. And their eyes were open. And they knew that they were naked, and the best thing they could do was make a fig leaf apron. And the whole study of the Bible is how God can help man get his clothes back on. That's the whole story of Genesis to Revelation. And guess what? It must have worked because by the time you get to Revelation, the 18th chapter, the Bible says John saw an angel come down from heaven and he was lighting the whole earth up with the glory of God. That means God is going to get what he wants. From the beginning of time, God said, fill the earth with my light. And in the last apocalyptic book of the Bible, God fills the earth with his light. God is going to get what he wants. You and I have to decide, will we be part of the team or will we not? So light is a very important subject with God. It should be an important subject to us because this is the foundation of the church and its function in the world. From the beginning of time, God had faithful souls who were the light bearers, making him known to a world that knew him not. Now, does the church have a visible component or was it just faithful souls? If you study, I, I won't go over this right now, but you can take those down, these verses. In Matthew 24, 44 to 51, it talks about how, how God has good servants and evil servants in his house. Don't lose that. God has good servants, God has evil servants, but they're both in his house. So what does that mean? That means that the church is also a visible structure 
where there's faithful souls and unfaithful souls in that structure. Don't lose that. The church of God is a visible location as well. It's not just simply faithful souls that are obeying everything God says. The church also has a visible component, kind of like the building we're in right now. And the building we're in right now, praise God, there's some faithful souls. But how sad it is, there might be here also some unfaithful souls. The church is a visible component as well. Now watch this. Understanding this, this is why we can appreciate this statement. Will you accept the sign of obedience? Read and study the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Israel their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Notice how the Lord regards these professedly pious ones. God knows how to distinguish between the righteous and unrighteous in his what kind of church? Visible church. The professions and assertions of men are nothing in his sight. Obedience to his holy law is a sign of true faith. So even though the church can consist of faithful souls, it can also be a structure that houses faithful and unfaithful souls. Another way that God defines the church is in 1 Timothy 3.15. God says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I looked up these words pillar and ground. The word pillar means support, and the word ground means basis, foundation. So when God talks about the church, he's talking about it being a place that, in summary, the church started out as faithful souls and eventually grew into a visible body of worshipers where faithful and unfaithful souls fellowship together. In the house of God is to be found the very foundational truths or light that makes people free from the bondage of sin. This is the description of the church. Now go to Revelation chapter 12. When you go to Revelation the 12th chapter, we're about to start transitioning. In Revelation, the 12th chapter, the Bible says something. And we would do well to consider what the Bible says. In Revelation 12, starting at verse 7, it's a story many of us are familiar with. The Bible makes it very clear in Revelation 12 and verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So you remember that Satan came along as a serpent, you know, and he's obviously trying to deceive Eve, and he did, and then ultimately got Adam along. Well, we're reading this story right now. And what does it say in verse 12? In verse 12, it says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. The Bible is very clear that Satan hates the church. Satan is at war with the church. And Satan fights the church however it exists. An example, Satan's method of attacking God's church. Notice, every way that God's church existed, Satan comes along and he tries to fight it according to how it existed. Notice, in the beginning of time, faithful souls constituted the church. So what did Satan do? He said, okay, I'm just going to set up unfaithful souls. An example, Faithful souls, Abel, Seth, Enos. Unfaithful souls, Cain, Lamech, 
and many others. Then the church eventually started to transition from just invisible faithful souls, and it started to become a visible church. When this happened, God set up a chosen nation. So what did Satan do? He said, no problem. I will fight them with rebellious nations. So the chosen nation, Israel. The rebellious nation, the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and all the other ites. The people of God, the chosen nation, they started to fall so deeply into sin. You see, I always wondered why does Satan want to pick after the church? Why does he want to fight the church so bad? Why does he hate the church so much? The answer is very simple. You and I are not the focus. Listen carefully to what I'm saying. The reason the devil attacks the church so much is because the truth is you and I are not the focus. You see, go to the, I'm going to show you a secret. Go to Isaiah 63. I'm going to show you Satan's focus. Every single time, Satan gets you to sin. Every single time, Satan gets me to sin. There's a higher goal that he has than you and me. Look at Isaiah chapter 63. In Isaiah the 63rd chapter, the Bible spells it out very, very clearly, and we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 63, and we're considering verses 8 and 9. When Satan makes you fall, when Satan makes me fall, the focus of the devil is really not you and I. It's somebody else. And in Isaiah 63, I want you to see what the Bible says. The Bible says in Isaiah 63, verses 8 and 9, For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior. Now watch this. Verse 9 is still talking about the Savior. Verse 9 says, In all their affliction. That's the people of God. It says, In all their affliction. It says, he was afflicted. Notice that. Every time we were hurting, who else was hurting? The Savior. You see, if you read Revelation 12, it said the dragon's fight was with Michael. That's who his fight was. Michael, in the Hebrew, Mike means one who is like. El means God. This is talking about Jesus. Michael, Jesus. Now watch. Satan's fight has always been with Jesus. But he knows that every time Jesus loves you and loves me so much that every time we go through pain, he goes through pain. Every time we suffer, he's suffering. Now, any parent in this room understands what I'm talking about. Mothers especially. When you see your child suffering, when you see your child in pain, does it not bring on suffering and pain to your heart? Why is that? Because of the love connection we have with our child. We are all children of God. And Jesus knows that every time, and Satan knows that every time he gets you and I to fall, we're not the focus. When Satan gets me to fall into sin and I fall, it's as if Satan walks over to my body, puts his foot over my body in triumph, looks Jesus in the face and says, is this what you died for? Look at what I'm doing to him. Look at what I've convinced him to do. I got him to do everything that breaks your heart. Why would you be so foolish to die for this garbage? And he rubs it in Christ's face. You see, when we sin, we just think about the pleasure it brings us. We don't think about the pain it causes in the heart of God. Every time that we just say, I just want to do it one more time. I just want to enjoy my sin just one more time. We don't understand the pain that is renewed in the heart of God. 
What more could he have given to show us how much he loves us? Is there something more that he could have done? Tomorrow night, we're actually going to start going through the plan of salvation. The first thing I'm going to show you is how low God came just to save you. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked you and me. That's tomorrow night. But the devil knows you're not the goal. I'm not the goal. Jesus is the goal. Every time he hurts us, he's hurting the heart of Christ. And so here it is. God raised up this light. He raised up this movement of light. Satan says, watch what I'm going to do to your people. I'm going to put their light out. You who did everything you could to get them to be so great, Satan says, watch what I'll do to them. I am going to literally dim their light, and eventually I'm going to put their light out. And so here it is, the children of Israel, their light started to get so dim that God says, I'm going to put you under a probationary period. You better get your act together. You got 490 years. And that's the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 through 27. 490 year prophecy. God says, I'm going to give you plenty of time, nearly 500 years to get your act together. The question is, did the children of Israel get their act together? No. So you know what God did? God transitioned the church in the wilderness, and he transitioned it to the Christian church. Satan says, no problem. I will set up the apostate church. The Christian church, the church built upon the apostles. The apostate church was the church built upon the papacy, the Roman Catholic church. This is what Paul was talking about in 2 Thessalonians 2 when he said that this power is going to rise up that's going to try to sit in the seat of God, showing himself that he is God. That was the papacy. And God said, all right, no problem. God says, you know what I got in store? God says, I have one last phase of the church. God says, I have the remnant. Satan says, no problem. I have Babylon. I want you to see there was no time that the church existed that the devil was not there ready to fight and to destroy the church. What I'm about to show you tonight, I'm just showing you some of the latest news. But the reality is, is I'm trying to show you historically that the devil has always attacked God's church. The gates of hell have always been trying to attack and to destroy God's church. And if you remember what I said, you see, when you think of remnant, the seven-day Adventist movement. Babylon is the papacy mingled with the fallen churches. This is the last fight. This is the last battle right here. And this is the battle that you and I are in right now. And so the reality is, family, is that God is trying to say, look, for the longest while, the devil has been trying to wreak havoc in the church. And this is why we need to understand why we're seeing what we're seeing right now. See, I don't know about you, but I see a lot. I know a lot of people turning blind eyes to what's going on. And it really challenges me at times. I see evil prevailing, not just in the world, but in the church. I see sin prevailing, not just in the world, but in the church. And it's not just a bunch of unconverted members, it's a whole lot of unconverted leaders. Just like in Bible times. And there are men that are more concerned about their pockets than they are about thus saith the Lord and all the sheep that Jesus died for. The Bible in John chapter 10 calls them hirelings because they don't really love the sheep. They're more concerned about their job. They're concerned about the retirement packages. Isaiah in Isaiah 56 called them dumb dogs that won't bark. And then later on he said they're greedy dogs because their mind is more on their money than on all the precious souls that are being leavened by the prevailing iniquity and sin that the devil has brought within God's ranks. 
You see, the reality is, is that this church, God, when he raised up the church from the beginning of time, Satan was already on it. This is not new stuff. This is from the beginning of time, throughout time, up until right now. When the Apostle Paul was getting ready to leave, and um, he was going to leave the saints because he knew he was going to Rome, and he knew that they were never going to see him again. Paul gave some warnings about the wolves in sheep's clothing that will show up. You see that wolf looking like a sheep? There's a lot of that going on nowadays. But the reality is, is that Paul says, Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Why would Paul say I'm innocent? That's basically what he just said right here. He says, I'm pure from the blood of all men. Why? Let's look at what Paul says. He says in verse 27, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this. Look at Paul now. Good preacher. Good pastor. Look at what Paul says. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He says, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Paul says, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul loved the church, and he loved them too much to let them believe a lie. Paul said, after I leave, people are going to come in. They're going to act like shepherds. They're going to act like good members. But they're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul says, I have warned you night and day. So that means that this is something that Paul did a lot. He says, night and day, I've warned you about this. And I did it with tears. Therefore, when it happens, Paul says, I am pure from anyone else's blood. You know what that means? That means that when evil comes in the church and when sin rises in the church, and if we don't say anything about it, you are not pure from the blood of all men. If someone gets lost, God just might hold us accountable for what we did not do or did not say when we should have done something and when we should have said something. Now, when you study the seven churches, all throughout the church history, God saw the problems. He prophesied about it. He told us that things were going to happen. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. So whenever you study the seven churches, remember that. Look at this part right here. When it says here, let's see. Yeah, there you go. When it says the things which are, that means that's in the time of John the Revelator in Asia Minor. But then it says, and shall be hereafter. That means that there's an application to the seven churches that's past the time of John. You understand that? What is, is during the time of John. Hereafter is after the time of John. That's why when you study the seven churches, you must see the prophetic implications. You can't just look at the seven churches as something that was just in existence during the days of John. They represent eras of time. So here we go. The seven churches of Revelation. In Revelation 2, Ephesus. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you've lost your first love. So already the first church was having problems. Looked like Satan is again having success with God's people. Then the church of Smyrna. Ch Smyrna did okay, but it wasn't easy. Look at what it says. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. So Satan was on Smyrna. 
He says, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. And you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So again, he's showing Satan's on you guys. But hold on. But when you get to the church of Pergamos, you see Satan succeeding again. I have a few things against you, because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things, sacrifice unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So notice, God is already rebuking the different church errors. And he's saying to them, you guys are not doing good. You're letting Satan win. How about Thyatira? He says, I have a few things against you because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Look at all of what's happening amongst God's people. Satan being relentless family. Then when you get to Revelation 3, again, Sardis, I have not found your works perfect before God. So once again, the churches are really messing up here. Philadelphia, ah, Philadelphia did all right. God had no rebuke for Philadelphia. God says, I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. So Philadelphia did good, but Philadelphia was running out of energy. And it says, thou hast a little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name. But by time you get to the last church, Laodicea, it says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would you were cold or hot. And so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that you are wretched miserable, poor, blind, and naked. God has laid out the attacks of Satan prevailing as it looked over the church. But what did Jesus promise? Jesus says, the gates of hell will attack, but the gates of hell will not what? It won't prevail. But as you can see, the church was constantly under attack. So by the time you get to the last days, what did God say was going to exist amongst his people in the last days of earth's history? What was the prophecies that God said that was going to happen amongst his own church, his own people, brothers and sisters? Let's notice what the Bible says. Number one, in Ezekiel, the eighth chapter, we can't even go over it all tonight. But if you study Ezekiel, the eighth chapter, many in the church of both leaders and members will practice many abominations. You see, if you're seeing abominations being practiced in the church, you're actually in the right place. Listen carefully to what I just said. If you are seeing abominations, people practicing or doing certain abominations, that's a sign you're actually in the right place. Because if you were part of a church where there was no abominations happening, it couldn't be God's last day church. Because the Bible prophesied that his last day church, there will be many in it of leaders as well as members that are gonna start practicing the very things that the Bible calls an abomination. And this is why I'm not surprised. You see, brothers and sisters, I've been in this church for 31 years. I've been a leader in this church for 25 of those 31 years. And what I'm telling you is I've seen just about everything. I've seen the most atrocious things take place. Some of them were done by elders. Some of them were done by pastors. Some of them were done by deacons and deaconesses. Some of them were done just by the average common members that were joining the church. You know what a lot of people did? They left. They said, what? These sins are going on? I'm out of here. And I'm like, where are you going to go? Where's the better place? The only, there's only one place to go to, and that's right in Babylon. You see, we were told 
that these things were going to happen amongst God's people. But we don't see God telling us to come out of her. The only church that the Bible says in end time prophecy to come out of is Babylon. But God does tell us to come away from the people in his church practicing the abominations. You see, I'm going to tell you the truth. I did a study with this couple, Carlos and Lissandra. And when I did the study with Carlos and Lissandra, they were not Adventists. And I was studying with them, studying with them, and they would visit Seventh-day Adventist churches a lot. And I remember Carlos says, man, I love what I'm learning. I'm in. Lissandra kept saying, I'm not ready yet. And I would say, okay, Lissandra, what's your concerns? She said, I don't, I don't really know. But she says, I'm just not ready yet. I said, okay. Kept studying with them, kept studying with them. I started to study with Carlos and Lissandra. Carlos said, man, I'm in. I said, Lissandra, are you ready, my sister? She said, I'm not ready yet. I said, what's your reason why you're not ready yet, Lissandra? She says, I'm not sure, but I'm just not ready yet. There's something. So I was driving one night, heading to Carlos and Lissandra's house. This is a true story. And I was ready to teach the lesson that we had set up. And you know what God told me to do? In prayer, God told me, teach them about how I prophesied that apostasy would come amongst my people. I'm saying, Lord, I'm trying to get her baptized. If I tell her that apostasy and sin is rising up in the hearts of your people, she's going to be like, oh, I'm out of here. But it was very clear. The command from heaven was clear. Tell them the reality of what I said is going to happen amongst my people. I said, okay. And I went over this study that I'm doing with you right now. When I finished the study, Carlos said, I'm in. And I looked at Lissandra and I said, Lissandra, what do you think about this study? And Lissandra looked at me and I will never forget it. Lysandra looked at me and she said, I am now ready to be baptized. And you know what I said? Why? That was kind of foolish. I should have never said that. But it, it, was, it was a human reaction because in my mind, I'm thinking, man, I'm presenting something so bad. That's what I felt. So I was like, why? What, like, what, what made you change your mind? She said, Dwayne, she says, I've been visiting your churches for so long. And she says, I see Sabbath breakers. I see people who love the world. But she says, but I see you. I see others. And what I've realized is that now you showed me that God forewarned us that this stuff was going to happen. And that when I join the church, I have a choice. I can join the church and be part of the problem. Or I can join the church and be part of the solution. And they are still faithful members till this day, and that's over 12, 13 years ago. You see, beloved, God wants us to understand people are not dumb. People are not blind. They see what's happening even amongst us. All you got to do is spend one Sabbath, and you can start seeing very clearly there's some people that love the Sabbath, and there's some people that absolutely hate it. There's some people that love the Bible. There's other people that just use the pew to take a nap. God says, listen, I told you these things were going to happen. Be disgusted, but don't be surprised. Because it doesn't stop here. You see, God also said the sins that Israel did, God says amongst my own people, many of them will do the sins that Israel did. Do you know that there was a lot of people in Israel's day that said, we don't want this health program that God's given us. We don't want this manna. We want the old flesh pots of Egypt. You know, there's some of us today in the church that talk about the health message. And you got both leaders and you have members that are saying, I don't want to hear nothing about any health or, or, or any of that stuff. Jesus ate fish. I'm going to eat fish. 
God says that I can eat this stuff, I'm going to eat it. I don't care. And it's like they're not even teachable. I had a guy one time, I was in Florida, and literally I'm talking about health and how God loves you and wants you to be healthy. And then I started talking about some of the dangers of chicken. The brother raised his hand. This is a true story. I can't make this stuff up. The brother raised his hand. He said, preacher, I got something to tell you. I was like, go ahead. What you got to tell me? He says, I love, and he did it like this. I love my chicken. I'm going to eat my chicken. And ain't nobody going to stop me from eating my chicken. Doing some weird dance and all this stuff, talking about how much he loved his chicken. And I remember I looked at him and I was like, man, that's deep. So I, I was like, Lord, what do I say back to him? And then I realized that God gave me a good thing to say. I went back to the brother. I said, can I ask you a question? He was like, yeah. I said, what did the chicken ever do for you to make you so loyal to it? I said, you look like you're ready to die for a chicken leg. I said, all the thing did was raise your cholesterol, raise your blood pressure. It's done nothing but bad for you. It tickled your taste buds for a New York second, but at the end of the day, it raised your cholesterol, it raised your blood pressure, it raised your glucose levels. I mean, why are you so loyal to this thing that's destroying you? Jesus could use that loyalty, brother. He calmed down after that. But in the days of Israel, there were people who fought against the manna. Today, there are people who fight against the principles of health that God gave us so that we could be happy. In the days of Israel, they got tired of Moses. Why do we have to listen to Moses? I'm a prophet too. They began to fight against the spirit of prophecy. They didn't want to hear it. They said, I have the gift of prophecy too. Dathan, Korah, and Abiram. What do we see people today? You say, Ellen White says, oh, I don't want to hear what Ellen White says. I don't want to hear what that woman has to say. There are people who make jokes about her. They make jokes about her prophetic gift. They don't want to hear anything from that woman. They don't even realize they're repeating the sins of Israel of old. They don't even realize it. The same stuff that Israel did is the same thing that many of these people are doing right now, and they don't even realize it because the heart is deceitful. God says, that is what I prophesied about. How about this one? Self-righteous. Family, do you know we could go home a lot faster if we would stop focusing so much on degrees and focus on anointing? There are some people that are clearly gifted, they are anointed, and they are powerfully and mightily being used by God. But because of some of our self-righteous attitudes, we say, well, I went to school and I got a master in divinity, so I know what I'm talking about where this person doesn't. And some of these guys can preach circles around these individuals who have their MDivs. They're doing far greater work. Now, I'm thankful there's a lot of people with masters of divinity that are also consecrated men and women. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is that family, there are some of us that we have a very self-righteous attitude. We get a position. I've learned a long time ago, when I became a deacon, when I became an elder, when I became a pastor, it didn't matter. The higher I go is the more I am your servant. That's the Bible, brothers and sisters. That's what the Word of God teaches. But there are people today that they get caught up in their position. They get caught up in their degrees and they get caught up in their titles. Some brothers don't even like being called pastor anymore. Now it's doctor this and doctor that. It's almost like pastor is, is, is a down thing. What is that? Self-righteousness. It creeps up in our hearts if we're not careful. We say to people, you haven't been to the church as long as I have. What could you possibly teach me? Probably a lot. Probably a lot. But God says this is something that was going to start plaguing my people. They were going to start thinking more of themselves than they should, thinking that they're better than others, thinking they're more important than others, thinking that they're smarter than others. Self-righteousness. And then... Many individuals will allow God's love to fade from their hearts. 
because of the rise of sin. God prophesied that. Many in my church, God says, they will start becoming more cold, not caring and not loving the people, not loving the sheep. You know, in John 5 and verse 42, you know what Jesus said to the Pharisees one time? He says, I know that you do not love the sheep. That was a scary thing, man, for Jesus to say to them. Because as a leader, you're supposed to really love the sheep. You're supposed to die for the sheep. But Jesus looked them right in the eyes. John 5, 42, you read it. He says, I know that the love of God is not in your heart. I know you don't love the sheep. And you know why this is happening? Because there's so much sin. So much sin in the world. So much sin in the church. Even ministers, let alone members, stop believing. They don't really believe it. And so for a lot of people, this is just a job. For a lot of people, it's just a position. I just do my job. I just do my position. Did you know, family, that if you're a head deacon, deaconess, or, or whatever it is, it's not your position. It's not your office. You're a servant. You're a servant. It's not my department versus somebody else's department. You're a family. We're all supposed to work together. Personal ministry shares with health and temperance. Health and temperance shares with family life. Family life shares with deacons and deaconesses. So they all share with community service. We work together. We're a family. This is not a time for us to get on a soapbox and say, this is my little department. Stay away. Leave out. Don't touch our budget. This is how we frustrate the work of the gospel. It's like, don't you care about the sheep? That should be the number one question in a board meeting. What is best for the sheep? What is best for the people? But today, brothers and sisters, this is what's happening. Let me bring this to a close. The summary. Satan has attacked God's church for many centuries. The sinfulness amongst church leaders and lay people is heartbreaking. But the good news is, God has a plan. You see, I started this message telling you, I love this church, and I'm committed to this church. And yes, there's a lot that came into this church, a lot. But God has a plan how he's going to get rid of it. And my focus is to make sure that I'm following God's plan, and I'm about to show you God's plan in our last few minutes together. God says, I know what's coming amongst my people. Therefore, he says, I got a plan. The plan is called the sifting or the shaking. God says, here's my plan. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve. But he promises, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. God makes it clear. I'm going to shake up my people, and the bad is going to leave, and the good is going to remain. This is the work that's going on right now. So when we talk about what do we do now, here's the answer. First, Isaiah 55 and verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That's the first step, is if you can look in your life and say, I know that I'm repeating the sins of Israel of old. I know that there are things that the Bible clearly calls an abomination, like lying lips, amongst many others. Maybe we're gossipers, and we love to sow discord amongst brethren. That's an abomination in the eyes of God in Proverbs 6 and verse 19. If you can realize and say, Lord, I know that there are some things that you call an abomination, but I know that I'm doing it. I know that there are sins that Israel did of old, but I know that I'm doing it. I know that I'm becoming more cold-hearted towards people, more careless, more indifferent. Yes, you've fallen into Satan's trap. Yes, the devil set you up. But the Bible says... Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So that's the first thing, is find out where do I fit in this? 
And if you see yourself erring, may we forsake our ways and our thoughts and return to the Lord. What do we do after that? Isaiah 58. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. You can't stay quiet. You cannot remain neutral and expect to receive God's favor. And guess what? You might lose some things. You might lose your position. You might lose some friends. You might even lose your job. John the Baptist lost his head. Jesus was crucified. Paul was beheaded. You can still suffer a little longer than they did. The reality is, is that you might have negative ramifications, but watch this. If the love of God is really in your heart, it will compel you to do it for the sake of the people. And watch this. If the love of God is not in your heart, that's why it's easy to say it's somebody else's problem. The pen of inspiration says, just as long as God has a church, he will have those who will cry aloud and spare not, who will be his instruments to reprove selfishness and sins, and will not shun to declare the whole counsel of God, whether men will hear or forbear. I saw that individuals would rise up against the plain testimonies. It does not suit their natural feelings. They would choose to have smooth things spoken unto them and have peace cried in their ears. I view the church in a more dangerous condition than they have ever been. Experimental religion is known but by a few. Last sentence, the shaking must soon take place to do what? Purify the church. The whole purpose of the shaking is to purify the church of God. God is going to get what he wants, and that's why he's doing the shaking. But some may say, that's right. That's why I left the church and I started up another group, independent of all these conferences and everything else, and I started up my own church so we can have a pure church. I have a message for those people. Take a look. You will take passages and the testimonies that speak of the close of probation, of the shaking among God's people, and you will talk of a coming out from this people of a purer, holier people that will arise. Now all this pleases who? The enemy. Should many accept the views you advance and talk and act upon them, we would see one of the greatest fanatical excitements that has ever been witnessed among Seventh-day Adventists. This is what Satan wants. The answer is not to say there's sin in the church, there's sin in the conferences. Let's leave and start up our own church and our own conferences. The servant of the Lord is clear. This is what Satan wants. You know, Jesus loved the sheep so much, he said in John 10, I'll die for them. That's what we do. We don't leave the church because this is the only church God is trying to purify. There's no other church. But this idea of a comfortable cakewalk in God's church, we need to understand, no, that's not going to work either. If you really love the people, listen, I'm not here to tell any of you, start doing stuff. You got to talk to God. But what I am telling you is if you do love the people, you can't remain silent. That I know for a fact. If you really love the people and if you see it, I'm not telling you to go look for stuff you can't see. I'm talking about what do you see? What is it that you already see? What is it that you already know is happening amongst God's people? And you know it's wrong. There's no question in your mind. You know it's wrong. You know it's sin. You know it's not right. You know it's against the word of God. You're clear as day on it, but your conference president is doing it, so you keep quiet. Your pastor's doing it, so you say nothing. How can you stand in the favor of God and you know it's wrong? I'm not dealing with what you don't know. I'm talking about what you know.
There's no way you can say you have love for the people. And if you don't have love for the people, that's your first work. Go to Jesus and ask him, put your love in my heart, Lord. I don't love the people. The iniquity is abounding, so I'm getting at a point that I just don't really care. I don't even care about my own soul, Lord, let alone everybody else's. Father, this thing has turned into a job for me. I get paid. I get my medical bill coverage. I get a very nice package because our, our church offers some pretty nice packages. And I just mind my business, stay low, and I just do my job. But here goes God saying, I'm sorry. That will not be acceptable. No, the answer is not to break away and start off offshoots. That's not the answer. But the answer is not to remain sitting down and remain neutral and say nothing either. In the eyes of God, that's just as evil, if not more offensive. Although there are evils existing in the church, you see, this, this was written, family, this is written. Although there are evils existing in the church and will be until the end of the world, the church in these last days is to be the light of the world that is polluted and demoralized by sin. The church, enfeebled and defective, needing to be reproved, warned, and counseled, is the only object upon earth upon which Christ bestows his supreme regard. Let the church say amen to that. God says, this is where my focus is. But what is needed? Reproof. What is needed? Warnings. What is needed? Counsel. Will you do it? That's the challenge. Remember that as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Don't forget, love needs to be the foundation of why you do this. If you don't have love for the people, you'd be better not rebuking them. You might be dangerous. Did you hear what I just said? If you don't have true love for the people, you'd be better off not rebuking them because you probably would be dangerous. You might end up hurting somebody. We have to have a Christ-like love that stands up against the sins that we see taking place in the church. But it needs to be a love for the soul that we're rebuking, not a disgust, not I'm sick and tired of them, not I'm tired of this, so I'm going to tell them. That's not the mind of Christ. It doesn't matter if it's a leader or a member. You have to see a soul that Jesus died for that you're saying to yourself, Lord, I love them too much to let them go on in this way. I must confront them. Daniel did that when Daniel prayed. Do we know of any sin that Daniel committed in, in, the book, in the entire book of Daniel? We don't know a single sin he committed, but look at what Daniel said. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Do you see how Daniel includes himself? You see, one of the first signs of Satan is when we begin to exclude ourselves, to say those evil people over there. You already know you're going in the wrong direction. The way that we address this is, Lord, I do see what the people are doing. And I do know that I didn't do that, but because my heart is united with them, I come to you saying, Lord, we have sinned, not they have sinned. Moses did the same thing when Moses said this. Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, what did Moses say? Blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Blot me out, Lord. Moses said, Please forgive them, and if you can't find it in your heart to forgive them, then just take me out of the book of life as well. Do you have that kind of love? for the bad people in your church, it's the only love that can truly rebuke the saints and do it the way Jesus did it. Jesus saw us as sinners, but what does the Bible say Jesus did? He became sin for us. Are you seeing it? This is what God is calling us to do, family. 
Yes, we have to stand up against sin. Yes, we need to call it out by its right name. Yes, we need to address it, whether it's found in leadership or amongst the lay members. Yes, we need to do that, and it's a very uncomfortable work, but the love of Christ will compel you. But it must be his love. Not just your disgust of sin, but your love for the soul. It must be both. Yes, have a disgust for sin, but have a love for the soul. Summary, God is shaking up his church. He will shake up the church by raising up people in it that will cry aloud against the sins residing in the hearts of the people, both leadership and lay members. But self-sacrificial love will be the motivation for such rebukes. When I was preparing this message, I knew that I said, man, tonight's going to be long because it's a, it's a lot of information, but this, is, this was so sensitive that I had to take my time because if I would have rushed, it would have made it a lot easier for somebody to walk away misunderstanding what's being said. There are ministries out there that are attacking God's church. I'm aware of them. I'm aware of the ministers. Some of them are people that used to be my friends. Some of them are people I used to work with. And now they're making a whole YouTube career trashing God's church. I believe that work is 100% evil, born from the heart of Satan. But I believe also that another extreme is that there are a lot of us who are ministers and evangelists and otherwise, and sometimes we make it seem like we don't have certain problems. And we ignore a lot of things that are taking place that's keeping us from being prepared to meet our God. And I don't want to be counted amongst those ministers either. So I dare to try to stand right in the middle to still affirm this is God's church. God is going to have a people that's going to go through all the way through the final scenes of earth's history. God is going to have a pure church and a pure people. But there are some things that have crept within, like Paul said. And these things need to be addressed. And while I don't speak with a whole lot of unnecessary specificity, I think we're getting the point. When somebody asks a question, these are the last bit and we will be done. And I thank you in advance for the patience that you have demonstrated, for I knew that this was going to be longer than any of the other meetings that I would do. So I am, I'm serious when I say thank you for holding on. Thank you. And God bless you. Look at this. What does such a minister or ministry look like that, that embraces the word? This is the last part of our presentation. There's a book called The Remnant, written by a man named Clifford Goldstein. Clifford Goldstein is, work, works with you know, the Sabbath school department to help put together many of our Sabbath school lessons to date. He believes in God's word. He believes in the church. But he wrote this book called The Remnant. And it says, with all of its new light emphasis on good works, health reform, Christian standards, and latter rain expectations, the Seventh-day Adventist Church struggles with many of the same vices it condemns in the lost world outside its doors. The inconsistency of profession and practice, painfully evident in our denomination, causes many to doubt the church's remnant status. Others see spiritual pride, hypocrisy, and arrogance in this claim to chosenness. What's the truth? If you can add this book to your library, I would encourage you to do it. He faithfully walks through how God has always had a remnant out of his own people that would hold on and be faithful when a lot of other individuals started going astray and doing wrong. He shows historically how this thing was there. Then you have Joe Cruz, the former president of the most powerful Seventh-day Adventist ministry in the world, Amazing Facts. Today, Doug Batchelor oversees this precious ministry. Joe Cruz wrote many books about the sins outside the church. But these are the three books that Joe Cruz wrote about inside the church. Reaping the Whirlwind, Creeping Compromise, and Enemy at the Gate. These are three books that he wrote that dealt with how Satan's trying to come within to unfit the people of God. And here's what Elder Cruz said. The most tragic thing about the worldly state of the church is that she doesn't recognize her own miserable plight. She is comfortable with the way things are going. Platitudes and generalizations roll over the ears of Laodiceans without making the tiniest impression. Books and articles have also been written about the need to repent of this loathsome attitude which God detests. 
yet we see the situation almost growing worse. Why? Why hasn't the message been heeded? I've analyzed many of the appeals in our publications, and they are wonderfully presented, but as I studied deeper, I discovered that almost none of them spelled out what to repent of. He continues by saying, suddenly it became clear to me why there was so little response. Those eloquent appeals to turn from sin bring no response because Laodiceans cannot see. They are incapable of discerning sin. Vague terms like sin do not really register with them. They need to have sin defined, described, and delineated. We have assumed too often that the Holy Spirit will take over and teach the details if we just provide the general appeals. The true message to Laodicea will boldly declare that sins are being committed by the church members and even by the institutions of the church. Unless these evils which bring the displeasure of God are corrected in its members, the whole church stands accountable for them. M.L. Andreessen wrote a little book called Letters to the Churches. When all these, when some errors started to come in, Elder Andreasen wrote, this is more than apostasy. This is giving up Adventism. It is the rape of a whole people. It is denying God's leading in the past. Do you see how God always has faithful souls? He always has somebody who's going to speak up. He has somebody that's going to take a stand. M.L. Andreasen did it, and boy did he suffer. If you know anything about the history of Elder Andreasen, he suffered for taking that stand. But love motivated him to do that which was uncomfortable. It was Herbert Douglas who followed up after Elder Andreasen, well after, and he wrote about the same things. I'm going past these. Then there was Robert Pearson, former General Conference president. In his closing message to Seventh-day Adventists as the GC president, he said, members have to be exhorted to live up to the standards, while at the same time the standards of membership are being lowered. The group becomes lax about disfellowshipping non-practicing members. Missionary zeal cools off. There is more concern over public relations. Leaders study methods of propagating their faith, sometimes employing extrinsic rewards as motivation for service by the members. Youth question why they are different from others and intermarry with those not of their faith. He says in closing, fellow leaders, beloved brethren and sisters, don't let it happen. He says, I appeal to you as earnestly as I know how this morning, don't let it happen. I appeal to Andrews University, to the seminary, to Loma Linda University, don't let it happen. We are not Seventh-day Anglicans, not Seventh-day Lutherans. We are Seventh-day Adventists. This is God's last church with God's last message. The apostasy cannot and it will not prevail. Yes, there will be those within that will try to redirect and misdirect, but God has already promised, I'm going to have a people in the end that's going to stand up. You and I get an opportunity to be counted amongst those people. It was Ted Wilson when he came up as our GC president. And Ted Wilson himself said, Seventh-day Adventist church members, hold your leaders, pastors, local churches, educators, institutions, and administrative organizations accountable to the highest standards of belief based on a literal understanding of Scripture. I show you this to show that I'm nothing new. I'm just another one. I'm just another one. There's prophecy being fulfilled in the world, but the prophecies are also being fulfilled in the church. And you know what that tells me? Jesus is right at the doors. There's not a lot more that needs to take place. All God is doing is he's looking for people who love him more than they love themselves, more than they love their image, more than they love their positions, that they are willing to say, Lord, here I am. You gave up everything for me. I surrender all to you. What can you do if you have some of these problems? Pray with and for them. If you have leaders, if you have fellow members in the church that you see some things going wrong, start by praying with them. Pray for them. Okay? The Bible teaches that. Then, if possible, approach them. Do it one-on-one, -on -one, though. Don't bring a group with you. Just go one-on-one -on -one and just say, hey, brother, sister, can I talk to you? People are way more willing to listen 
if you go to them one on one. If you come to them in the spirit of a brother, the spirit of a sister, and say, I have a genuine concern that I want to talk with you about it and do it one on one, you sometimes will have great success with this approach. Pull some of your people aside, talk with them one on one, reason together with them. Then, when necessary, bring other witnesses that are not privy. In other words, if they don't listen to you in the one-on-one, -on -one, and it's really important, bring other witnesses that are not privy. Don't tell them the story. The first time they hear the story is when you're with the other person. You don't want to prejudice their minds. So don't go to them and say, you know, pastor's an evil person. He did this, he did that, he did this. Now I want you to be a witness. You, you, already, you already conditioned their minds to be against the pastor. Don't do that. Just say, hey, I'm following the Bible. I need another witness to a situation I'm having with someone in the church, and I need you to just be a faithful witness and provide counsel. If they say, well, what's going on? Say, I'll tell you when we get there. And then you bring it up where there's no opportunity for bias. It says, when necessary, bring other witnesses that are not privy to the issue, raise the issue with the person present, and if they still won't listen, bring it before the church in business meeting or another fashion that allows all church members to know what's going on. Sadly, sometimes this has to be the step two. If they won't hear you at all, there are times it can require a full disclosure, disclosure before the church members without their consent. The Bible teaches that. Sometimes, if they're just not going to listen, then sometimes you have to just bring it up. And you bring it up before the brethren. It's not an easy thing to do. But sometimes that's what you have to do. Lastly, remember God's self-sacrificial love should be the motivation for the effort you are making. This should produce reconciliation between the accused and God and his people. This is the goal. So our last summary, standing up against error, apostasy, and sin is not easy, but a must. But God's love for the erring soul must be present in the heart of the one rebuking or correcting. The Lord will give us this love and strength to stand when needed, but we must go forward. Satan will work his miracles to deceive. He will set up his power as supreme. The church may appear as about to fall. Hallelujah, look at this. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. While the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless it must take place. None but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and true, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouths. The remnant that purify their souls by obeying the truth gather strength from the trying process, exhibiting the beauty of holiness amid the surrounding apostasy. My brothers and sisters, prophecy is not just being fulfilled outside. Prophecy is being fulfilled inside. It is sad. It is very solemn. But God loves this church. And all he's doing is he's looking for people that are willing to let his love reside in their hearts so that we don't go either extreme. We don't want to start doing offshoot stuff and breaking away from the church and start attacking God's church. Please don't do that. But we cannot do this other extreme, which I think some of us are probably in this room a lot more guilty of. We see stuff. We know stuff. And we just stay silent. And we act like there's no God. And we just feel like men and women can just control God's church. God is saying, I want you to start talking with me. God says, I want you to start, number one, looking at yourself and seeing, are you part of the problem? But then after that, God says, we got to start speaking up. Let the love of Christ be in the heart. But we need to start addressing some things. We need to start having some very deep meetings. We need to start talking with brethren, praying with brethren, laboring with brethren. And family, I promise you, 
if you take the steps that God tells us to do, you will see the power of the gospel. You'll see the salvation of the Lord. You will see the strength of Jesus. And I promise you this was not an easy message to give. It's not my common. The Lord has made it very clear that it needs to be done. And my hope and my prayer is that you leave here with a right understanding of what has been shared today. Prophecy is fulfilled within. Prophecy is being fulfilled without. We need to make sure that we truly are people being prepared to meet our God. And remaining neutral is not the answer. We need to plead with the Lord, what would you have me do in such a time as this in Earth's history? And I assure you, God who loves to talk to his people, he's going to let you know what to do. And when God purifies his church, may we be counted on the side that remains and is purified rather than those who are shaking out and remain corrupted. Question, did we understand our study today? Let me see your hands. Is it your desire to say, Lord, by your grace, I will be like Lysandra. I will be part of the solution rather than part of the problem of what's going on in your church. If you're willing to make that covenant, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. You're going to need the strength of Jesus to do it. And if you don't stand to your feet, I respect that. I respect that. This is a very serious decision. It's a very serious decision. Very serious decision. But if you're standing, I want you to know angels record our standing. Don't stand just for standing's sake. You're standing up, as the song said, for Jesus. You're standing up for his present truth. You're standing up for the saints who you love. And you really want to make sure that they are preparing to meet their God. That's why you're standing. And I promise you this. Michael will stand up with you. Jesus will stand with you. And one plus God is always the majority. I thank God for you enduring all this time. Let us bow our heads and let's pray together as we close out. Oh, loving Father, we thank you so much for everything that we studied tonight. Lord, thank you for giving us as your people an extra level of endurance. I hardly saw anyone sleeping. It looks like everybody was paying attention, Father. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit will settle the truths that we're studying in their precious hearts. Help us, Lord, to avoid going far left or far right. Help us to be centered right in the middle. Help us, dear God, to see that prophecy is being fulfilled, but there's a great work that you're calling us to do, and in the strength of Jesus, we can do it. And I pray in the end, may we be found faithful at last and be your last day, Joshua's and Caleb's, and realize that we can take the land. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, and God bless you richly.